Opposed? Abstaining? The motion carries. And now I'd like to pass things off to Dr. Smith for the recognition of our 2020 retirees. Great, thank you very much. And I get to uh, kick it off to Mr. Suzo, who will be presenting his last round of retirees for the Hopewell Valley Regional School District. Uh, we have a banner crop of retirees uh, this evening. I really just like to thank them all for their dedication and work um, for the district. Um, no one expected for us to end the school year this way but they finished up as they began their careers to uh, true professionals and i couldn't be more thankful and appreciative of all their efforts um i've had time to spend with each one of these individuals um and i'm i'm better for it having known many of them um and the district is better for it having them interacted with our students mm -hmm. and their colleagues so i turn it over to mr suzo so thank you dr smith mr suzo i'm sorry if i could interrupt for just one moment Yep. Could I kindly ask that, uh, remind everyone to mute themselves unless speaking, just so we can all hear the presentation. Thank you. So, first of all, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to present to the Board of Education, our class of 2020 retirees. Um, each retiree has demonstrated excellence, incredible work ethic and dedication and professionalism during their career in our district. They have done an incredible job supporting and servicing students staff, parents, and our overall community. Uh, all of our retirees hopefully should have received a certificate in the mail. I know we had a few late retirees that came in, so that may be still in progress. Um, and also should have received a nice little special gift from the district. The certificate that they received read, for dedicating your life to the art and science of teaching, for practicing your professionalism with compassion and dignity, and for holding the well-being of your students as your primary concern always, Congratulations on your retirement from the Hopewell Valley Regional School District. And in the past, we would always like to have our retirees in person and have them have the opportunity uh, to meet the board and shake the hands of our board members, but obviously we can't do that. So I did put this, some slides together just to show each one of our retirees so everyone can see who they are. And incredibly, this evening, we have 481 years of experience that's represented which is absolutely incredible. So we're just gonna go through for each one of our retirees. So we're gonna start off first um, with Lynn Angeles, who is a elementary teacher at Stony Brook Elementary School. Doug Brower, who was with us up until the end of December, our K-12 supervisor of business, media, practical arts, and instructional technology. Mary Ann Calvo, elementary teacher, Stony Brook Elementary School. Woo! Joanne Cermelli, special education teacher, Timberlane Middle School. Cindy Davidson, elementary teacher, Tollgate Grammar School. Kimberly Rennick, science teacher, Timberlane Middle School. Rebecca Goldstein, Learning Disabilities Teacher Consultant for the district. Beth Horvath, our district registrar. Alfonso King, custodian, Hopewell Elementary School. Chris Ann Kirby, elementary teacher, Hope Elementary School. Kevin Kerwin, counselor, Bear Tavern Elementary School. Francis Kuzma, a bus driver and van attendant. Debbie Lawaz, math teacher, Timberlane Middle School. Karen Lucci, science teacher, Central High School. Jane Mangino, elementary teacher, Stony Brook Elementary School.
Don McBean, custodian, Bear Tavern Elementary School. Allison Scarola, special education teacher, Central High School. Debbie Chalette, elementary teacher, Tollgate Grammar School. And finally, Terry Solomon, English teacher, Central High School. So it's a large group of retirees, an amazing group. And what I'd like to say to you is the administration and the Board of Education, thank you for your service to the district. Go forward and enjoy the next phase of your life. And while doing so, reflect back on the many lives you positively impacted during your time in Hopewell Valley. Congratulations to all of our retirees. Little sound effects there. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Suzo, for that that lovely presentation. I'd like to say a few words uh, as well on behalf of the board. Um, the class of 2020 retirees is quite an impressive one. Um, there's no way around saying that. Um, I'm not trying to show favoritism, but what what an incredible bunch of folks. Um, I feel honored that I've gotten to know a number of you um, personally over the years, and um, I would say that my children and many, many other children um, have become better students and, quite frankly, better people because of the influence that all of you have had on our students um, and that you've affected their growth and their development and that you've inspired them, and um, we thank you for that. So please know how much we appreciate your efforts and how much we will miss you. Um, on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to thank you for your service and your dedication and um, for all that you've done for the students of this district. Um, you, uh, some of you have uh, enriched their lives in the classroom. Others have um, taken care to maintain our facilities or to work in an administrative capacity or as counselors. Um, and we, we appreciate your efforts. Uh, we wish you all the best in the future, and um, in the near term, we wish you a restful summer. You've certainly earned it. Uh, be well, and thanks for being with us tonight. Okay. Again, thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm sorry. Did someone else have something to add? I heard a microphone. Just making sure. All right. With that, we will move on to less exciting things. The, uh, the board president's report. Uh, if you'd like to stay with us, we're happy to have you along, but we uh, understand if, if you jump off. <laughs> okay, so as we near the end of the school year, I'd like to take a moment to recognize um, our students and their families for a job well done. Uh, parents, thank you for rising to the occasion to support your students amidst the many challenges that have confronted you over the course of these past three months. Uh, with your assistance, your students have worked to make the best of a difficult uh, situation, and it hasn't been perfect, but working together and with our incredible staff, um, we have made it to the year's end. Uh, I'd like to say a special word of congratulations to our class of 2020. While this is a different year in which to graduate, uh, the board applauds you for your efforts and wishes you great success in the future. Um, I'd especially also like to recognize the fifth and eighth grade students. Uh, this is a challenging year in which to move up um, and on to a new chapter in their lives. And please know that the board will continue to support uh, the district administration and the staff as, as we move forward with your transition to the next level. Um, the board is committed to supporting the achievement and the social and emotional needs of all of our students. Um, as I've done at prior board meetings, I would like to offer the board's thanks once more to the district administration, the faculty and staff for all that they have done to support our students during this remote learning period. Um, in a year like this one, we can't say it enough. Thank you. Thank you. We applaud your creativity, your dedication, and uh, your commitment to your students. The board is also firmly committed to district efforts to support your health 
and future success. Uh, the board will work closely with the administration throughout the summer to make arrangements for the upcoming school year. On another note, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Treese for organizing the community dialogue that was held on Saturday on issues of equity and race and social justice uh, and was moderated by Dr. Lauren Kelly of Rutgers. Um, I thought it was a very meaningful conversation, a very frank um, discussion and a productive one and was really heartened to see that we had, I believe, 90 uh, participants, which is fantastic. Um, the board recognizes the exemplary work that our district leadership and faculty have done um, and, and even prior to current events and on an ongoing basis to confront these issues and to support their students as they grapple with issues of equity and social justice. Um, as you will see in our student presentation this evening, our students have also demonstrated their strong desire to work for equity and justice. And collectively, we still have much to do, and the board is dedicated to those efforts. Um, as we mentioned in our joint, recent joint statement, the district administration and the board will continue to promote collaboration to support a more inclusive environment in our schools and in our broader community. We look forward to working on these matters with our partners in the community, knowing that our efforts will be more impactful when we work together. One of the best ways to affect change within your community is to become involved. And there are many ways to do this, but one significant way is to run for elected office. As I mentioned at last month's meeting, this year's annual school election will be held on November 3rd. Three three-year terms uh, will be on the slate for Hopewell Township. The deadline for filing nomination petitions uh, to run for positions for the board is 4 p.m. on Monday, July 27th. Nominating petitions are available for pickup at the business office or uh, through the Mercer County Clerk's Office. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or to other board members um, or to the business office for assistance. Thank you. And with that, I will pass it along to Dr. Smith for his report. Thank you, President Linthorst. Uh, I really appreciate your kind words towards the administration um, for all of our administration i really appreciate their efforts in getting us to this point in the school year i sent out a note and said that we've almost made it and we truly have almost made it and it was because of the work of so many people um, and i really can't thank our teachers our custodians our paraprofessionals our administrators all who have gotten us to this point um, and of course our students and our parents without whom we would have never gotten this far we were fortunate in Hopewell that we did not have to face some of the things that other districts faced. We have virtually all of our students have a device and internet connectivity. Um, so we were able to do much more than others. But as we talk about equity, it's, it's important for us to recognize that we had a head start on a lot of folks. Um, and that I think we did some great work um, and we'll continue to do great work. Um, but recognizing that there were there were others that did not have the same means as, as we do to uh, achieve. Um, so that's an important realization. I also appreciate your words about equity. Um, as we talked about on Saturday at our forum, is we can't do this work alone. Uh, we need the community behind us. And you mentioned uh, elected officials. Uh, you're going to hear from two students this evening who I think have great futures, um, whether they choose to do elective office or anything. Um, really have a, a bright future in terms of, of making change. Um, first up is going to be a student presentation um, by Dhruv Kapadia. You might remember Dhruv, he came uh, probably about 18 months ago to the board and talked about our school calendar um, and really uh, provided us um, the support we needed to move forward with that decision making. Um, today, we've had some conversations about equity. Um, Dhruv was a participant in our CHS Diversity Club they did a survey uh, probably about a year ago. Um, he's going to talk about some of those results and really some things we need to move forward. But I, I underscore this again, and Deb, as you said it before, we can't do this work alone. We have a district plan. We have an equity plan. We have an equity statement. Um, and it's important for us all to push this work forward. It can't just be the social studies teachers. It can't just be the English teachers. It has to be every teacher in our district, pre-K through 12, having these conversations. But remember, we have students 182 days and seven and a half hours each day of those 182 days. It needs to be a community conversation. So that's really where 
our focus has been, and we want everybody to join in in that conversation. We are happy to host these conversations, and we will do so, uh, continue to do so. We're going to host another one in October. Um, and if Drew or, um, is ready, he could come back uh, or dial in from college. We'd love to have him. Um, but the work he's done and the conversations that he's fostered are really important for us. Um, so also uh, later this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about our return to school planning. I also would like to just say that, you know, we're, we have three days of school left and we have not received any guidance in terms of September, um, but there's still a lot of discussions taking place. So I'm just prefacing it. My presentation uh, this evening is all speculation. Um, we have, uh, you know, probably well over 100 people now uh, working on our return to school plan on some levels. Um, so it's important for us to recognize that we're working with the best information we have at this time um, to move us forward. So those of you who are going to stick around for the whole uh, kit and caboodle, um, that's what we'll end up with in my report. But um, I know Drew is on, and if he is ready, Drew, I'm going to kick it to you and let me know if you have troubles presenting, and we'll make sure that I get your PowerPoint up there. So uh, graduating senior, Drew Capadia is going to, uh, Drew, remind me, Boston College, I think it is, or University, Boston College? University. University, sorry. All right, Drew, you ready? Uh, yes, one second. All right, is my uh, screen being presented? You got it. All right, perfect. So, yep, thank you for the uh, warm introduction, Dr. Smith. Um, again, if you don't remember me, uh, my name is Drew Kapadia. I'm a senior, soon to be graduated senior at Hopewell Valley Central High School. Um, and I've been, for the last four years, been spending much of my time working on cultural t competency uh, and creating an anti-racist environment in Hopewell Valley Regional School District. Um, but due to the recent events and due to the recent killing of George Floyd, uh, it really was a moment that pushed me out of my comfort zone and really wanted, it, it really incentivized me to do something at a community level. So some of you may have seen, um, I recently created a change.org petition that outlined three reforms that Hopewell Valley can take to create an anti-racist and culturally competent environment. But before we can uh, talk about those three reforms, uh, I really wanna outline the issue of racism in Hopewell. So, before we can do that, we really have to define what racism is because this is something that a lot of people in Hopewell tend to have a very skewed interpretation of. So in my eyes, and this is something I've developed with the help of my friends of color and other staff of color, uh, there's basically a spectrum of racism. There's subconscious to conscious racism. So what I mean by subconscious racism is certain things that are maybe not overtly racist, but tend to have some type of racially prejudicial uh, motives behind them. So, for example, a student having no friends of color, lacking empathy to those of other races, buying into Western beauty standards, and then on the faculty side, relating to white students easier and mixing up students of color. Now, I've been in the district for 13 years at this point, and I can't name a single year of my time in Hope Bowl where I haven't had a teacher mix me up with another brown student. And again, this is not something that you can call out as overtly racist because it's not. It's sometimes just an honest mistake. But it becomes a little repetitive when I have a teacher that I've maybe had twice already call me a name that I'm clearly not that person, but they just tend to look like me. They tend to have the same skin color. Maybe they're, they're the same gender. But for some reason, a lot of Hopewell Valley teachers, they'll make that mistake, but they'll be able to tell the difference between the 80% of, of white students in our district buying into Western beauty standards. Something that me and my brother, who also went through this district, always find funny is uh, the, the senior superlative of um, best eyes or, or best class eyes. It's almost unattainable for any student of color to win that award just because it's blue and green eyes that we're putting forward as the ideal best, uh, best eyes. Um, having no friends of color, I've been actively excluded from friend groups because of my color, because of the color of my skin, but it's not overtly racist. It's again, something that's just subconscious. Students tend to go through Hopewell Valley without exposing themselves to people of other backgrounds and other cultures. Now, when we're moving further right down the spectrum, you can see it becomes a little more overt, but it's still not something that you can immediately call it racist. Using right-wing conservative talking points to justify racist thinking. You know, we hear it time and time again from conservative pundits. For example, with the recent 
uh, a case with police brutality, people will say, oh, well, African-Americans in America, they make up 13% of the population, but they commit 50% of the crime. And again, lack the empathy and understanding and education to really understand what the flaw in that statistic is. And the reason that Hopewell Valley allows that to be perpetuated is because we don't have a diverse enough curriculum. We don't take the initiative to create this dialogue. And I know I've talked to Dr. Smith and we've had conversations talking about, you know, certain things that the district has been doing and certain things that the uh, that adjustments in the curriculum. I was on a call this morning with uh, Mr. Sherwin and uh, Ms. Claps talking about in the English department curriculum in the high school. Um, and again, there is still this, this uh, need to latch on to classic American, you know, history and classic Eurocentric history. So in order for there to be an actual education and adjustment to the curriculum that I'm talking about, there needs to be an, a, a massive transformative adjustment to not just the high school curriculum, but also the middle school and elementary school curriculum. Moving swiftly on, repeating harmful stereotypes through jokes. Again, that's something that can be cured through education and awareness. Denying or belittling the existence of systemic racism, something that starts when you're not educated properly. And then another thing that staff tend to do, lending more credibility to white students. Now, I've had amazing staff over the last 13 years at Hopewell Valley, but I can't say, uh, and, and it's, it's fair, but I can't say that every single staff member has been culturally competent. There have been moments in my time at high, in, in the high school even in recent years where I can clearly see that I have to go out of my way to earn the respect of a white, uh, of a white faculty member, whereas a white student can easily have their voice heard compared to the amount of work that I would have to do just to get into the room. And now if we're moving over far right to the conscious racism, again, this is the stuff that we tend to react to. This is the type of stuff where there is something substantive that comes after it using racial slurs in any context, overtly claiming one's race is superior or inferior, things like this is what gets news attention. It's what gets articles written about us and it really paints our district in a negative light. But these are unfortunately the only instances of racism that actually make it to this board. It's the only instances where we really consider maybe we should add this, maybe we should transform this. But in reality, the vast majority of instances of racial prejudice in Hopewell Valley take place on this side of the spectrum. It's subconscious racism that students of color have to deal with. And the funniest thing was, I was talking to my friends before I was giving this presentation today, and I was explaining to them this, this uh, spectrum that I've come up with, and they immediately understood it. It didn't take me very long. I didn't even have to finish explaining it to them because they already knew that this is the spectrum of racism that students of color go, to, go through uh, in Hopewell Valley. So keeping this in mind, uh, I'm going to now quantify racism. So as Dr. Smith had mentioned uh, last year, me and two of my other friends, uh, Alyssa Liu and Rehan Yadav, we sent out a petition to the entire uh, student body of HVCHS, and we got around 546 responses from students. Um, in those responses, I won't get into the depths of some of the quotes we received, but they were extremely tone deaf and racially prejudicial. But again, this is what's expected when we don't take too much time to educate a lot of our students in the realities of students of color, in the realities of the experiences faced by students of color. So looking at the data, around one in every five students at HVRSD experiences racial prejudice. Another interesting correlation with that is also one in every five students at HVRSD tends to be a student of color. So again, an interesting correlation there. Moving swiftly on, 65% of HVCHS students actually witness racial prejudice. And this is the worst statistic to me. Only three and a half percent of students in the high school ended up reporting the incident to faculty. Only 20 students ended up actually going out of their way, that, that answered the survey, only 20 students ended up going out of their way to report the incident. And that's because we don't have a, a real outlet for students to feel comfortable addressing this issue. And that's because we've normalized the, scent, the, the state of racism to having to only be conscious racism, not subconscious racism. And so it's just, it, it's saddening to me because I know personally I haven't reported things. I know my friends have not reported things because we just feel like we're not going to be heard. And oftentimes we're not heard. Uh, and and that's, that's another issue. But as I address in one of my reforms, which is hiring a, a race relations counselor, that's exactly what that would be creating. Um, and lastly, 7% of HVCHS students openly admitted to making racially prejudicial remarks. Uh, this entire survey was anonymous, but we still expected students to obviously not want to admit to that. But even then, it's, it's just interesting to see the lack of understanding that some students face in terms of what is actually racism. So 
This unfortunately doesn't stop in Hopewell. It, it extends past our district's borders and it extends into Mercer County as a whole. Now, these are just articles that I've compiled from the last four years of my time in, uh, in, in the high school. And this isn't just in, uh, in Hopewell Valley, this is across Mercer County as a whole. And so when, you've, when we've uh, basically created an environment when students don't feel the need to report instances of racism and become essentially numb to it, this is a reality that ends up happening. It affects the community as a whole. It's not just stopping over here. And what I've talked about with Dr. Smith in the past is that we need to be the district that, that leads the rest of the county. We should be the district that takes the initiative and passes real transformative uh, changes to our curriculum, to our staff, to anything that, that really could help create an anti-racist environment. And for the better part of the last year, to further add on to my last point about how this affects the community as a whole and the county as a whole, for the last year, I've, I've taken place, um, I've dropped a class to take a concentrated study uh, looking at the current state of de facto segregation in Mercer County. Uh, I had presented to Dr. Smith, along with other uh, faculty and state legislators. And this is just one of the slides taken from the presentation, but this is the Mercer County School District racial breakdown of each school district uh, uh, in the county. And so what you can see here, is that you have clear racial divisions in each uh, uh, school district. So you can look at West Windsor, it's sitting at around 77% Asian versus when you're looking at Trenton Public Schools, it's almost entirely made up of Latino and black students. And then looking at Hopewell, we have the highest white uh, population. So Mercer County, which is a fairly diverse uh, student population, has a very diverse student population, has very segregated boundaries. So how does this play into Hopewell? Well, for one, Hopewell students already living in a very high socioeconomic bubble, then also don't get exposed to other cultures, races, uh, religions, and we're, we're legitimately just stuck in this bubble having to only be exposed to our own. We're never going out of our way to expose ourselves to Trenton students, to West Windsor students, to Ewing students. Instead, we sit here, and what tends to happen is we kind of get a demagogued image of these other school districts. Um, and this graph on the right is the exact same data. Uh, it's a radar graph. Um, this is basically just showing the, the y-axis is effectively the color that over, overlaps with the y-axis is effectively saying how uh, populous that specific racial group is. So for example, Hamilton is sitting at around 47% uh, white, of a, of a white population in their student body. Um, but what you would hope to see in an integrated county is a clear overlapping uh, sh shape of some kind. But what you actually see is little to no overlap. You see where there's a lot of white, there's a lot of nothing else. Where there's a lot of Asian, there's a lot of, not there's a lot of nothing else. Same for the black and Latino population. So it's clearly segregated, there's no overlap. And for that reason, there's no exposure. And this goes into the three reforms that I've been saying. So first off, as I had mentioned on the uh, petition, it's hiring a race relations counselor. So like I had mentioned earlier with the survey, one in every five students experiences racial prejudice. Um, three out of every five students actually uh, witnesses it, but only 3% of the entire student body actually does something and reports it. And the effective goal of having a race relations counselor, whether that's training an already uh, existing and hired counselor or hiring a new counselor, would be to create an outlet for students of color to feel comfortable to have these conversations. It's not just to increase the number of reports, but it's also for us to have a better and more sophisticated understanding of what the nature of racism is. Again, to me, most of the racism that I have faced in high school has been on the subconscious side. And I, I, a lot of my friends of color would agree with that. Um, but we won't know that unless we have a race relations counselor that can provide that uh, dialogue to our students and effectively allow our students to, you know, open up and, and feel comfortable in, in their own uh, learning environment. Next is reforming history and English curriculum. Now, I could go on about this specific uh, uh, change. I know Dr. Smith uh, has been working, uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Trees have been working uh, very, very diligently to, you know, add more diversity in our curricula. But honestly, still, in 13 years of high school, I have read, I have never been assigned a book uh, regarding the Latino perspective, the LGBTQ perspective, the South Asian perspective, the East Asian perspective. And even then, the Black perspective is so skewed. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate to see how our English curricula is taught. And as I had mentioned earlier, I've been in conversations with 
Ms. Claps and uh, Mr. Sherwin to effectively add more authors of color, but that doesn't just stop there. It's even how we're teaching history. In my 13 years at Hopewell, I have spent maybe two days on South Asian history. Two days, and that's the fastest growing demographic in this entire school. An entire dynasty and empire that preceded all of the Eurocentric kingdoms that we study for months on end and years on end. An entire dynasty is completely erased from our history curriculum. And what does that do for a student? If you're a white student growing up in Hopewell and you already have some type of subconscious racism, because every student has subconscious racism, so every person has some type of subconscious prejudice, everyone has an implicit bias. But if you're going through 13 years of Hopewell and you aren't even exposed to a South Asian, an East Asian, a Middle Eastern, or a Latino historical figure of power, it completely skews your perspective on how the dynamics of power, the dynamics of race relations look in the real world. You know, in, I, I, I joked with Dr. Smith, but this is the reality of it. In my, all of my years in Hopewell, only the only figures of power that you see in government, in society, tend to be white. And the only person of color that I have really been focusing on throughout my time in Hopewell is MLK and it's still a whitewashed MLK. It's an MLK that for some reason we decided to teach as this peaceful man who didn't sympathize with violent protests even though he did. We don't focus on him being a socialist revolutionary. Instead, we focus on someone who just marched peacefully. And just like that, civil rights happened and racism vanished, just like that. But th this isn't the reality. You know, We spend little time on Malcolm X. We spend little time on Stokely Carmichael and tons of other revolutionaries. So again, when I'm talking about reform and curriculum, I'm not saying just add another author of color. It's adding and really transforming the way we teach history. And lastly, creating a half-year cultural competency graduation requirement. Now this to me is the easiest to implement just because it, it really involves the least amount of work in terms of there's no more money that has to be thrown at anything. It's it, We already have graduation requirements. We have the visual art, we have the practical art, and now we have the uh, uh, personal finance for financial literacy, but we don't have cultural literacy as a graduation requirement. And I know this isn't mandated by uh, the state, and we would be one of the first districts in actually in the entire state to do something like this. But as I had talked with Dr. Smith, I'd be fine with that. And I think everyone on this board should be fine with that being the flag bearers of, our, of, of cultural competency, of creating an anti-racist environment would look good for our school and it would, it would effectively create an anti-racist environment for our students. Um, and again, I know Dr. Smith has been working on having a mandatory class for freshmen, but if that doesn't end up working out, we already offer classes in our school that, that effectively fall under this cultural competency graduation requirement. We have uh, Ms. Silverman teaching sociology and race, class, and gender. We have Mr. Cyrus teaching world religions. Um, but some of these classes don't even end up running because there aren't enough students signing up. And these are valuable classes. Uh, for me, I took, I took sociology this year and I had a lot of white uh, students in my class and they agreed that it was a very eye-opening class. Um, and to, it, it, it hurts me to see that there's only maybe 20 kids in the entire school that take it per year when it really could be an influential class that creates this environment that we're looking for. And now I've laid out the three reforms, but how is it reflected in the community? As of last night, I had 2,000 signatures in about uh, a week or so of the, sign of, of the entire petition being released. 2,000 people went out of their way. 330 people went out of their way to share it. And the funniest thing is, I, I, to me, uh, these, these changes are very tamed down, very neutral, very, very easy to implement, and they're not that radical. And I know that's true because there are students in my own class that follow me on all my platforms of social media and have reposted this same petition that I know have heavy conscious and subconscious biases and yet they still went out of their way to repost this. Whether that was to look good and whether that was to fit with the social media trend that's been going on lately, I'm not sure. But to me, that proves that these are not radical solutions. These are solutions supported by the entire community. And to me, it would be, it would be shocking if these were not implemented in Hopewell Valley. And I end it with what will HBRSD do? And I know we've been doing a lot. I know that our district has been going out of their way to, to increase cultural competency, but a lot of the time it's been reactive. And that's what I'm posing towards the board. All of you as elected officials have a duty to be proactive, not to be reactive. I don't want to read another instance of Hopewell Valley being painted as a racist school district because I, I personally loved Hopewell. I, I love the teachers, I love the friends I made, and I hate to see a school district that I know is not inherently racist be 
painted as some racist figure in, in our community and in the state when that's not true. You know, we keep on putting band-aids on an infected wound. It's not going to end up stopping if we keep on making incremental changes. We need something radical and we need something that will actually cause some type of change and uh, cultural, cultural competency in our district. So on that note, I, I'll open it up for any questions. Um, I'll exit out of the presentation. But again, this has been my experience in Hopewell, and I'm looking forward to hearing what any of you have to say. Dhruv, I thank you so much for that presentation. I, I am continually impressed by the work that you do and, and the heart that you bring to everything that you've presented to this board. Um, I feel your frustration. I feel the emotion behind this for you. Um, obviously, this is very personal to you. And I, I appreciate your putting yourself out there like that to this board. Um, I, for one, would like to go on record as saying I want to be the district that is the leader in this regard. And I, and I believe firmly that our administrators feel the same way. Um, I know we have strides to make and believe me, you've given some real food for thought this evening. And, and I hope that we go forward with that and that um, we affect some of the change that you're promoting. Um, I'd like to open it up to any other board members that might have questions for Drew. Uh, Drew, this is uh, Debbie O'Reilly. Fantastic job. I love your passion. It's so um, contagious. You know, it makes us all want to go out and do something. I think we, you know, sort of sit back and just feel like, what can we do? What can we do when we, you know, form committees? And I, I like that your, your presentation had concrete ideas. And I wanted to ask you, if we were to choose maybe one or two courses that had to be mandatory for graduation, um, learning about uh, diversity or equity, what do you think that should be? Um, so, I mean, again, from my experience, I, I definitely am a big fan of sociology taught by Ms. Silverman. Um, I honestly didn't have the ability to take a lot of the other classes. I know race, class, and gender was running for the first time this year. Uh, I wasn't able to take it, and I, and I don't know what ended up happening just because of, of uh, coronavirus. Um, and the other classes, world religions, I knew I know it was a popular uh, class in years in the years past, like when my brother was in the school district. But I mean, again, I think those two those two classes offer students the ability to choose what they want to you know learn about and be exposed to. But it still does put that mandate on them that they have to take some class to be exposed to other people because a lot of students in Hopewell are not going to go out of, out of their way to take those classes. Uh, and it's an unfortunate I, reality. So, but I would say those two classes, along with race, class, and gender, would be um, would be very uh, beneficial. Okay, thank you. Drew, John Grillo here. Um, tremendous job. Just, I mean, I don't. I think I don't. I don't know many adults that can uh, speak as eloquently as you and as passionately as you. Um, so I'm really impressed with what with what you've put together. Um, and I think you've really um, been able to articulate the Hopewell bubble and put it in context, especially for someone like me who did not grow up in Hopewell. Um, I don't yet have kids in, in school in Hopewell. So um, I thought that, that was really nice. I The question I have for you is, um, in your opinion, what does success look like? You know, what does good look like to you? Um, you know, if we were to make some changes um, 12, 18, 24 months from now, how would you measure success for us? I mean, again, it's 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 hard to measure success. I, I know I had talked with Ms. Smith because she was very involved with um, sending out the uh, survey, and we had talked about maybe in four years after the people that had taken place in that survey had graduated, we resend out the same one and see how things have changed, um, which, I mean, obviously would take some time, but that's something that could clearly measure uh, how how our school has changed. But another thing that uh, I know Dr. Smith and Dr. Treese have really been looking at is the change in demographics in our school. So inherently, if our school is getting more diverse, specifically with the Asian population that's increasing exponentially, when that's happening, I feel like there is already going to be the student aspect of kids being able to have more exposure to students of color, students of different faiths, students of different cultures. So. I mean, it'll be, I say resend out the survey in a, in a few years and see what's going on. And I do genuinely believe if that if a counselor existed throughout my time at, at the high school, there would be 
less instances of, of racial prejudice because what ends up happening a lot of times is it just gets swept right under the rug. We don't, it doesn't get reported. No one who actually was the, the victim gets any type of satisfaction or any type of, you know, uh, closure on the issue and the person who did perpetrate the incident doesn't get any type of recourse. Drew, this is Adam Sawicki. Th thank you again. I think my fellow members have, have expressed my feel sent sentiments in terms of, of your ability to present your, your arguments. It's excellent. Um, you mentioned, uh, and uh, this is actually a question for Dr. Smith and Dr. Treese as well. Uh, you mentioned the, the course that Dr. Smith has thought of for incoming ninth graders. One of the course that we have all our ninth graders take is world history. And that would seem to be a logical place to address some of the issues you had stated in terms of exposure to a, a, a greater variety of, of world cultures. I, I completely agree with you. In a, in a world we are in today, um, you know, the fact that in the high school, we don't have world history class where you're studying various aspects of Chinese history or Indian history, Japanese history, it doesn't make much sense. So I guess my question for, for Dr. Smith and Dr. Treese is, is it possible to explore and perhaps report to the education committee? Um, what, what, from the standpoint of our state requirements, what has to be taught there? And do we have the ability to be flexible and expand out to some of these areas that we may have not given enough emphasis to in the past? You know, I know we have some requirements, but I, I think what Drew proposes is very logical. So uh, Rosetta can jump in because she's the curriculum guru. But uh, looking back, if you go back on our equity goals, it actually, the freshman uh, program, um, that was a goal that started last September that all uh, history classes in the freshman year would foster conversations about race and um racial literacy um, for that. So that's that was something that we had made the change, um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, moving forward with this. And then that's when we also instituted the, the race class and uh, race class and gender um, class. Um, but uh, Rosette, I don't know if you want to jump in. I mean, I if I could just respond just a, just a, a couple of points is, um, Drew, you said, you know, the, the watershed moment of moving forward, this is our watershed moment. And we're, we're really, you know, our conversations with you will enable us to move forward even quicker than we had hoped. Um, what most folks may or may not know is we've been working on this for upwards of five years. Uh, you know, I wrote an article about, um, you know, the struggles of an all white district in the state of New Jersey in 2017 in a, in a statewide um, journal. Um, so it's nothing that we haven't faced before. I think what happens is, and, and Drew hit on it, when there's not an issue, it is no longer urgent. So people don't want to push it forward. Um, so here's our opportunity is really to move the conversation forward. And, you know, I, I welcomed and I invited Drew here tonight because I think it was important for other folks to hear what we're hearing from our students. Drew, I don't know if you participated in one of the focus groups that we had last year, but you know, kids, we had over 100 kids participate in focus groups at our high school. And this is what we're hearing. And this is what our community needs to hear is that, you know, the other part about this is we can do a lot of work, but if, it's, if the conversations don't take place outside our four walls, that's the, the struggle also. So that's where, you know, our, our hope is that through all of this, we can expand a, a community-wide conversation. Because one thing that doesn't change, and Drew showed it, is our demographics. You know, I can't control the demographics in Hopewell, but what I can do is, is burst that Hopewell bubble and expose them to a, a world outside of, of Hopewell. And that was part of what our day of dialogue was and, and things like that. So Dr. Therese, I don't know if you wanted to jump in, but I have, I have to say, you know, you, Drew, is so, Drew is so passionate and so it's infectious. So when we spoke earlier this week, I mean, this is where we want to get to so that every student who graduates our high school not only is empowered to speak their own truth, which Drew just did, but also affect change, because that's the only way we're going to get better. And it's troubling that only 3% um, report. And that's, the, you know, we put in the anonymous tip line um, things, but, you know, is that the answer? Uh, obviously, it's not. Go, Rosetta. 
Um, yeah, so to, to get back to um, Drew's uh, comment about the social studies, our social studies curriculum needs and will have a complete overhaul. We do have flexibility as a district over our curriculum. The state has guidelines for what standards need to be taught, learning standards. Um, they're, they were heavily content based, which is why we have these, these curricula that kind of mirror the curricula, not just in New Jersey, but all over the state. The state of New Jersey has been working on providing us with new you know, curriculum standards for social studies now uh, since I've been in education. It's, it's been a long time coming. It's not a tested area. I mean, literally the last 15, 20 years, they've been promising these new standards. The new standards do roll out 20, 21, 21, 22 school year, not this year, but next year. And they're going to be very culturally responsive. They're going to be much more inclusive than what we've seen in the past. I know some of the teachers and some of the supervisors who've been working on those standards and they're getting to some of the things that we've been trying to do for years that they've been doing incrementally, like having an Amistad commission require that we teach slavery. So now that that happens in a pocket in certain places, instead of, you know, really looking at, you know, what slavery has done, not just here in this country, but across the world and kind of how that's evolved into other systemic um, structures that, that have kind of perpetuated the issues that we have today, right? Um, they've also, you know, having a Holocaust requirement, but then having that very fragmented and now they pass something saying, oh, we have to teach LTP, LD, LT, LGTPQ, thank you, I'm gonna write, <laughs> LGTPQ um, curricula. I'm sorry, living out some letters. Um, but we have to kind of address those uh, people that have, you know, contributed to our society that have identified um, differently than what we call the tradition in this country, what the you know, what everybody is, which is not right. So we're trying to cover all these things instead of just really teaching history in that everyone has contributed. Different walks of life have come and contributed in this country. And oh, by the way, that person might have been a lesbian. Oh, by the way, that person might have been a transgendered person. Oh, by the way, that person might have been African-American a person or a black person, right? Mm -hmm. We have to work on that overall. Um, so that that is something that is coming, but we're working on. It's not easy to work on these things because recently we just did a, a overhaul of our K through five curricula and it was very difficult for, for, for our teachers. A lot of us have been trained and taught this way. We were taught this way as students. A lot of these primary sources are missing and we have to dig them out. A lot of voices are missing in history and books are missing in history that existed and were published at the time that were just simply lost. So now as we try to dig and find these voices, um, it's work for us to re-educate ourselves. We're learning the history as we're, as, as we're going. We're trying to find these sources, like you've worked with Elaine and Bev, who they, this has been their life's work of uncovering these old documents and really publishing that history again. Um, I was sharing with some of my um, teachers just recently um, that uh, a, one, a, a book, um, Harriet Jacobs' History in the Life of a Slave Girl, that she published the same time that, that kind of Uncle Tom's Cabin was out, and her book outsold Uncle Tom's Cabin. And people don't even know that book exists because it was lost, <laughs> right? It was forced underground and it was lost for decades. It was just gone um, because of someone used their privilege and didn't like that her book was outselling theirs, and they kind of just squashed the book and it just disappeared. So I encountered that book in college. Many people don't know that it book exists, but the book is a more authentic, true story of what happens to someone who was living that experience versus a white woman who was writing from her perspective that had never lived it. And so we lost that book. So how do we find those books of Native Americans? How do we find those books of the first Asians that were here? How do we find those books of people that, that were here and then oppressed underneath that boot and then their voices were lost? So we're finding those things now and uncovering them and bringing them back to the curriculum and quite frankly, these things existed in Hopewell's curriculum at one point. We've been through this before where we've had riots in the 60s and the 70s. You shared that in your presentation before. And the, the same response happened that's happening right now. Everyone was outraged. Okay, it was brought to the forefront. Now we understood that this was a problem that we had to deal with. We couldn't pretend like it didn't exist because we saw people being attacked and spit upon and dogs sicked on them and water and all that, hoses and, you know, white america was outraged we were going to make change we had people working at various levels to make change so we had african-american literature added to curricula we had african-american history added chicano history women's history all of these things existed even in our own school district and then everybody calms down again we forget it gets quiet and then those books get uh, stuffed in a drawer 
And as I was fighting just recently about our English curriculum with, with, with our colleagues about this old canon, we're opening drawers and there are all the books that I'm asking for to come back, like Baldwin and all of the Harlem Renaissance folks and some of the Chicano writers. They're in drawers in Hopewell right now in our high school. So when you create the course where it just is a standalone that is a knee jerk reaction to this thing that's going to come up every 10, 20 years, it's something that's easy to make go away as soon as things get quiet again. We have to do a complete overhaul where it's embedded in all of our curriculum and it's really teaching history the way it's supposed to be, not just in social studies, which needs an overhaul and it's going to get it, not language arts. It needs to be math. We need to know about our great mathematicians that came from all walks of lives, all colors, women, men. We need to hear about our scientists, all walks of lives that make contributions in this country and around the world. We need to hear about these folks and not when somebody decides to make a movie about them. Not when somebody decides to dig up a documentary about them. You know, I'm learning things now as an adult that I never knew about our history as a country. And it's not my history, it's our history as a, a country, the contribution these folks have made. I went through all of high school not knowing Lee Harper, uh, Harper Lee was a, a woman. I really did. I didn't know I was a woman because they taught, you know, to kill a mockingbird, they kind of did it haphazardly. She wrote under a pen name that was was androgynous for a reason because women weren't being published. But I literally learned that book and did not know that was a woman until I got out of high school. Because that's how superficially my teachers taught the book. And there's a woman that's this lesbian that there's a story to tell beyond her just authoring that book. Her writing in the times when she was writing and Capote was writing, that's a story in and of itself. So the stuff that we leave out, the way we teach so much of our history is a problem. And um, we're going to make change, but understand, Drew, that it took us over 400 years to get here. And as much as we would like to move forward and make these changes, and we have, there are people that, that are struggle with it. There are people that struggle with this idea of implicit bias and their biases and having to confront those in themselves. And some people were going to go through these stages where they're going to be angry about it. They're going to be upset about it. They're going to struggle with it. They're going to have to have a couple years of even struggling with it before the light bulb comes on. And you have to be patient with them because they've been, you know, we've all been brainwashed into this idea that we all kind of have the same footing in this country. Everybody has the same access to everything. If you work hard, everyone's going to get to the same place. If they really, they're just not trying hard enough. They got to pull the, themselves up by the bootstraps. We've all been trained that way. Um, and it's hard to, uh, to really own that some of us have a leg up over others. It's, it's really hard. Um, so know that we're getting there. But you have to be a little patient with, with us to know that you don't fix over 400 years of systemic slavery and brainwashing by putting a curriculum in place. So we have to do a lot of work alongside that. And the work that you all did by, by coming to uh, talk to our teachers, the committees, the panels, when you sit in front of our teachers and tell them what's going on, because you're not speaking to, you know, folks not speaking out to the racism and things that happen to them is not new, right? My parents went to a segregated school. I grew up in a still very segregated South part of my life. I've been all over the country. I've been to schools that are very diverse and I've been to school where I was the only one. And the racism exists in every one of those. Every one of those, just because they're more diverse doesn't mean these problems don't exist. They still exist in every school because it's a, it's a country problem. It's something that we've been born with and bred with and we have to undo. It's gonna take some time. But oh, I do promise you this, we're gonna keep diversifying the curriculum we are going to make some changes to our graduation requirements that hold kids accountable to something more uh, than what we do. Um, cultural competency, having that piece in there is, is very important. And we've been talking about like kind of marrying that with some service learning, not community service where uh, mom and dad, you buy stuff and drop it off and they come grab it from the office and, and bring it over to the table. But some real community service where they're giving back to their community and really looking at, you know, the inequity in the world and, and figuring out how they can, you know, impact change through social justice. Those are things that we've been talking about for years and it's time to step up and do that. But know that we've been working on this for, we're gonna be working on this until y'all run me out of here. <laughs> and so, and Dr. Smith is gonna be working on this, you know, until he, he, he decides that he's gonna go mow grass as he always says. Um, we're gonna be doing this work um, and we continue to do this work. And, it, and this is not something that we're just starting now. It, it, it's, you know, it's been something that's been ongoing. So I've been talking a lot, I'm gonna shut up, but I just wanted to say that. And if I could just if respond, could... that was fantastic, Rosetta, thank you. Um, but 
Also, when we're talking about what we believe, I do ask people just to go on our website and look at our, our equity policy. The board worked hard on that. A lot of boards were afraid to put that equity, uh, a similar equity policy in writing and still forget that. Um, so again, look at that. They are not just words to us. We live by those. Um, the other part about that, um, you talked, Drew, about being um, the flag bearer in the state. We were one of the first ones to pass the transgender policy, which gave students rights. So we're not afraid to be out there in front, and I relish the opportunity to be out there in front. And that equity policy was was one of those in, in a lot of our work on equity. Um, so we're not afraid, and we're going to use this opportunity to, to move us even further. Um, I did have just some highlights about our equity efforts, but I, I think I'm going to bypass that and just shoot you to the, to the website. But just know that um, we're looking at systemic issues here. And Drew, to your point, there, there's the kind of that implicit bias in there. And we're also looking at racial makeup of our upper level classes, um, because you've talked about it. But if you look at our AP classes, you know, specifically, you know, they're, they're, they're not reflective of our community, you know. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, they're disproportionately Asian, um, which is an underrepresentation in our district. Um, so you know, our African-Americans are not in our upper level classes. Again, a nationwide trend. But to Rosetta's point, these are national issues. But I've always said that I believe our size, our power, our brain power, our board support will allow us to address these and, and take it on and fix things so we can, when Drew comes back in a year or two, we'll be proud of the work that we've accomplished. Um, and that's our goal. You know, our goal is not to do it for, you know, people patting us on the back. I've presented at state conferences and national conferences on our equity work. And that doesn't really matter to me. It's really about a student who graduates from our high school has a positive experience. Um, so we really, you know, hopefully this will, this will empower all of us to move our work forward. And let me just say this. I would probably bet money that I don't think there's another Board of Education this week is having this conversation. I don't think of those kids who had petitions are having students speak to the board on the level that Drew spoke for 15 minutes on a cogent doctoral level presentation. So Drew, I know it doesn't feel like we're moving fast enough, but know that there are other places where the superintendent wouldn't call a student and said, hey, I want you to present to the board and you know, expose what kids are feeling like. Um, you know how it works. People sweep this under the carpet, as you said. So the part of our growth is exposing the ugly um, and moving through it um, and continuing to work hard and having students like Drew present um, and not being afraid of that and, and having the conversation um, because our kids are smart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something I'm, I'm pretty happy about is we have 52 people still on the line Typically, after our retirement presentation, everybody leaves the room, and we have one person left uh, in the boardroom. The fact that people are sticking around for this conversation makes me happy and, and gives me hope that we can move forward. Um, I don't know. That's, that's, yes. Yes. If I can make a suggestion, why don't you have somebody take some clips from this meeting Put them together. I mean, some of what Drew and, and you and Rosetta have said is just outstanding. Put them together and show them during the last couple of days of school. I think that would be a, a as as good a lesson as our students could get at the high school over these last couple of days before graduation as anything. Mm -hmm. Or use it for next year. You know, That's when the great. freshmen come in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Next year. There's a lot there. You know, in terms of what's our vision. I think it's outstanding. Um, I did want to end the conversation where we began the conversation on Saturday. Um, we had a young student who is also a graduating senior who wrote a poem just for Saturday. I asked him to present again. Drew, I don't know if you wanted to, to finish up with anything else. We threw a lot at you. I want to give you your time. Um, but I, I do want to give Ziad Nakra uh, an opportunity to, to really kind of – his, his poem was so powerful. I think this will be a great bookend to Drew's presentation when you bring us in. 
Uh, is everybody good with that? Um, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am, Dr. Smith. Um, All right, rock and roll. Good evening. Okay, good evening, I Board of Education. These two kids are rock stars in the Hopewell Valley. These are what we want graduates to be, um, that they can deliver um, in their senior year. When my senior is probably just waking up uh, at this point, that these, these guys are, are delivering um, thoughtful um, data to us. So uh, good evening, Board of Education. Uh, my name is Yezad Nakra. I'm a, a mixed race uh, student. Um, as Dr. Smith mentioned, I will be graduating uh, in a few days. And uh, this poem kind of reflects the, uh, a lot of what uh, Dhruv was trying to say, um, but also to convey, convey the, uh, the ideology of, of change that's necessary um, that we need to see within our community. Um, so it's entitled, Where We Want to Be. It is not through the winding ways of time and space nor the raging afflictions of nature's wrath to incite the change we see fit that brings us beyond our beginning. It is only through our proactivity where action breeds action, truth reveals truth, ambition counteracts ambition. We are the most precious resource which once spent can never be returned. Where you spend your finite energy gives rise to change upon change or eternal stasis. It is only through our proactivity where action breeds action, truth reveals truth, and ambition counteracts ambition. Where the unknown of right and wrong blasts hole after hole, snaps bone after bone, with only the innocent left to take the fall. To yet see a light beyond the encroaching darkness, when the well has long since run dry of hope. To dream of brighter days where the innocent remain innocent and the guilty are acknowledged as such. What is reality without fiction? It is only through our proactivity where action breeds action, truth reveals truth, ambition counteracts ambition. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I'd like to thank you for that. That's that's the second time I've gotten to hear the poem, and and I I wish I could hear it continuously. It's just it's it's such a lovely composition, and I really do appreciate uh, what you've put into it, and and the way you read it so expressively as well. So thank you. It truly is a gift that that we all got to hear that right now. Uh, and Drew, I'd like to thank you again too for your um, very helpful presentation. Um, you know, I'd like to say that one of the things that I think I'm learning as, as I go along into, as an individual is that um, part of the education, part of the process is learning to ask the questions that I don't know to ask. And you've given me a lot of food for thought and a lot of questions to ask now. So I appreciate that. And we will move forward with that as a board. Um, and I hope that we can call upon you if we have questions as we move forward, because I, I think that your input and your voice is very important. So thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. No, I, thank you again. I really appreciate uh, everyone hearing me out and listening to me. Um, and again, I'm not coming as a naive student saying that, you know, if we put together these three reforms, uh, racism will end in Hobo Valley. I'm not coming with that, with that perspective. But I am saying that, in my opinion, a lot of faculty, and even at an administrative and a board level, there is a disconnect between what the state of racism is in Hopewell. And for, for me, those three solutions were personalized solutions that I've talked to with other students that we believe would be the most effective in terms of addressing the issue as it is in Hopewell. Um, and, and that's what I'm really stressing here is, is the disconnect. You know, there are kids that, you know, even some of your own children in the, as board reps have these issues. And again, this is, this is what it is. It's so subconscious that we don't address it and we don't know how to address it. So anytime we say, look look at the other districts we're doing more than them let's let's pat ourselves on the back you know it's it's great that we are doing these things but when it still exists at such a systemic level and i understand dr Treese's point that you know this is a nationwide problem you can't you can only do so much but you know it, it frustrates me when you have kids growing up in hopewell living in a median household income of 130 plus thousand dollars 
and they still think that systemic racism doesn't exist and that they don't have a leg up and they believe that black and Latino students have an easier time getting into college. And being an 18 year old having to hear that and that those are the people that are going to be contributing to our community as a whole once they graduate is some of the most disheartening and frustrating things. So again, I understand we've done work and I'm very happy to be a part of some of that work. Um, and I know a lot of it I don't even know about because it's been in the work since I was maybe in eighth grade. But again, just my input, so much of it in, in th these three solutions to me are the easiest to implement. And again, I just want to make sure that we are aware of the issue as it is on, on a ground level. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Drew. Yeah, None of thank it's easy, you. But we're willing to do the, we're willing to do the heavy lifting. <laughs> Nothing's easy in this lane, but we're willing to do it. We got you. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, Thank you again. If, if you both want to stick around, we're going to talk about what could possibly happen in September and our reopening of school plans. But I'm only kidding. Just run while you can. You'll huh? be in college. Yeah, run, run while you can. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, both of you take care of yourself. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Um, what I would like to do as we transition, again, is just to give a shout out to two of our graduating seniors. Um, as Rosetta said, we have a lot of rock stars and a lot to be proud of in our district, and they're just two examples of that. Um, but if we could transition, I don't know if the board wanted to have any more discussion on that, but I would like to just kind of uh, go over what we know now in terms of our reopening efforts. And I don't want to spend too much time on you know what ifs, but I do think it's important for the board to be aware and our community to be aware of where we are. So um, our goal is to share this presentation with the board, then share it with the general community and have a, a survey, uh, return to school survey. I believe, I believe well, I'm probably gonna have to send that out twice um, now um, or shortly um, before uh, the end of the month. And then again, midway through summer as things change to get some feedback on what folks are feeling. Um, but I am going to present a brief update on where we are in our planning. So this is also part of our, um, in our agenda. But again, I wanna couch all of this was with, there's nothing has been decided. We have about a hundred people working on our plan um, in subcategories, but I just wanted to be uh, forthright and let people know kind of where we are in our planning. Um, a big one is people need to recognize that we won't make this um, decision in isolation. So I've already gotten emails from parents saying, you have to reopen school in September, you have to reopen school. Um, Part of that may or may not be our choice at all. Um, obviously, the state of New Jersey has been involved. The Department of Education will be involved. Our local health department, we have a meeting set up with our health officer, our school physician and legal counsel are involved, our staff representatives, all of those are already part of our decision-making and parent feedback when we get to that point. Um, also, the CDC has presented a um, decision-making tree of how to open and when to open um, through that. Um, this is from their website. You can see that. These are just phases that I developed. Um, and this is based on rumors that we hear coming in from the state of saying that if and when we do go back, we would go back at a 50% capacity or 75% capacity. So we just developed these phases of phase one, you have remote learning all the way to full in-person uh, learning. You don't necessarily have to go through the phases sequentially. Um, you know, the governor could say on July 15th, you know, start planning for 50% capacity, which we've started to do. Um, so that's what I want to go through a little bit. And I know this gets the, the most press or interest. Nothing has been decided. Nothing has been decided. But these are scenarios that we're looking at as a district. So obviously, uh, scenario A, a regular school day with social distancing parameters. Um, we would have our students back. We would just set up all of our schools to make sure that we're adhering to social distancing parameters. Um, you know, there's, I'll talk a little bit about health requirements as we go through this, but this is one of those scenarios. And I can say just in response to, to some folks who've said, you know, we don't want to go back to, we want to 
stay with remote learning. I could tell you as a parent of three children and a wife who's trying to work from home, there's no one who wants to go back um, to full-time education uh, more than me uh, just because it's the, the best thing for our kids, um, but it might not be our choice. Scenario B is synchronous learning, right? So that's where um, teachers are teaching in person to 50% of the students who are socially distanced in their classroom. The remaining 50% are attending the class remotely via Google Meet. So in effect, the teacher would have their laptop in class, kind of as they do now. We'd have a, a half of their students in front of them, half of the students at home meeting their social distancing guidelines. Um, that would adhere to a 50% capacity footprint, um, approximate timeline. You know, these are all just shots in the dark. We would do that for 30 to 60 days. Scenario C is alternating days. You probably have seen this, um, where students, you know, the way we looked at it, particularly on the high school level, because you have so many kids in multi-graded level classes, um, that the, the only way to do it really is by last name. Um, and then we would have half the students run a schedule, come on A days, half the students come on B days. Students not attending would be providing assignments and complete them on the off days. That would allow us to adhere to the 50% capacity. I would, again, based on, on current state trends, it would last for 30 to 60 days. Alternating weeks is another one. Um, you know, this could go A week or B week, or even one of the things that's become a big topic of conversation is a three-week cycle, um, which has students home for 14 days. So you'd split your classes basically into um, groups of three. Group A would come for a week straight, then they would go home for two weeks and, and participate in remote learning. Um, and that would be for the 14-day quarantine. I want to also just kind of reflect, none of these are optimum. We recognize that. But these are really based on conversation, based on reading, based on what's happening in other countries, kind of best, um, best practice of what, we are, what we're seeing. Um, another scenario is our pre-K. Uh, through two are live. Um, so they come in their full day and then uh, we're, they're spread out over six buildings and then our grades three through 12 are every other day or every other week. Um, the obvious here is pre-K uh, pre through two are one of our, our toughest populations in terms of remote learning. Um, so it's difficult to teach a, a student to read remotely. Um, so this would enable us to do that. Um, all teachers would be working every day, um, but the students would, would kind of go in and out. We would look at that, again, shot in the dark, 30 days transition, and then work towards a 75% capacity. The scenario F is, um, you know, and again, I want to preface this, that, you know, we have, what, three days of school left. We received zero guidance from the State Department of Education. Um, you know, and I said early on, you know, if we get no guidance, our default is remote learning. We don't want it to be that way, and we obviously have plans, um, but we would continue that. But remote learning will look very different in September if we do continue that. Um, and even if we do a hybrid, we are, there's the expectation that students will be um, having live instruction every day in every class. Attendance will be taken. Um, the goal is to facilitate a classroom experience as much as possible to facilitate a smooth transition. I want to underscore, we will be back to school in September. You know, I've, I've spoken to people and they said, if we go back in September, we're going back in September. Um, depending on the scenario, um, we will see. But at some point, we're going to get back to live instruction. It's just a matter of how we get there. Um, other things for folks to, to realize, and we've already moved forward with a lot of this, is ordering of hand sanitizer, disinfecting wipes in all of our classrooms making sure that hand washing will take place at regular intervals. Masks, you know, will the state require masks? We've already purchased um, thousands of masks. We purchased masks for our staff. We've, um, I've spoken to Mike Sullivan, one of our staff members who is making those protective um, shields for our first responders. He's making those for our staff. Um, will we be mandated to uh, screen all of our students before we come back to school? Um, something I, I put in my weekly update as we do have people in, in um, our buildings now, we are not having any visitors without an appointment. We're adjusting our ventilation systems to make sure we have increased circulation of outdoor air. Um, we're disinfecting our frequently touched surfaces. Um, we are planning to 
to space our seating and desks at least six feet apart when feasible. Um, we spent a lot of years um, bringing all of our desks together, um, but now we're, we're back to old school and having them uh, facing in the same direction six feet apart. As of now, and this is based on CDC, this could all change. Um, and the other big thing we're dealing with is um, school buses, that transportation. So one of our survey questions is going to be, would parents rather have, transport their own child rather than putting them on a school bus? Right now, I can tell you one of our sub uh, committees looked at if we were to implement social distancing guidelines on our buses, we would need 60 additional bus runs as it stands. Um, as I mentioned previously, the effective immediately, our meetings in our schools are by appointment only. Um, if you wanted or need to see uh, the registrar or staff member, or if you're a staff member or need to see somebody in HR or benefits, you need to call and make an appointment beforehand. And we ask that you wear a mask at all times. Big question is, okay, so what does it look like? What does reduced capacity mean? When I say 50%, what does that mean and how is it calculated? Um, so here's a capacity analysis process. This is what it looks like. Um, and then really, this is what it looks like. And these are there are the CDC physical distancing guidelines um, and how we would need to set up desks, the minimum and the more ideal. This is what a classroom then becomes. You know, on the, the far uh, side where you pre-pandemic, where we have 28 kids in, in desks that are close together and you think about lab tables in our science rooms, you reduce density and then even moving that uh, further of, you know, you had 28 kids and now you're looking at nine students in a desk. Um, that changed education as it is. Um, classrooms, you know, this is kind of what our classrooms look like now. Um, but things we have to do is having students, you know, again, as of June 15th, um, looking at how students enter and exit rooms, disinfecting desks, disinfecting teachers' desks. Um, one thing we have to recognize though, that kids, We'll break the rules, not intentionally, but you know, to have a preschool or a second grader wear a mask all day, many of us adults are having difficulty with that. It's just not realistic. Um, having to support them and work through that um, is a challenge for all of us. The corridors, the conversations about, you know, spreading out. Those of you who've been to the big stores, I know that they have arrows um, on one-way aisles and things like that starting to, to look at that at our high school where we have 1,100 students. Do we make hallways one ways um, through that? These are all things we're, we're looking at. Cafeteria setup, you know, so you look at our pre-pandemic where we just have a beautiful cafeteria and we just put in all new furniture to facilitate socialization and kids um, meeting together. And we bought on our, one of our elementary schools, high top tables, um, so kids can socialize on the elementary level. Here we are looking at social distancing where you went from, you know, 12 kids at a table to cutting that in half. Um, so that's it. Again, things we are looking at as of today um, and what that looks like. Again, with it, we have a unit lunch at the high school with 1,200 students. That's going to totally change how we deliver uh, lunch. And obviously our food service is on, our, on one of our subcommittees and the potential of delivering lunches into classrooms and things like that um, becomes a challenge. Um, as I mentioned here, it's six foot distance, uh, marking out spaces, adding shields for our, our payment and checkout points for folks. Um, but we're also might be using those during the day, those instructional areas and having time to disinfect those um, because our performing arts center say at the high school and our gymnasiums and the other levels, using those space to spread kids out. Um, you know, and again, um, changing the way we deliver food. Um, we have a lot of made to order food uh, throughout the district, which we've worked long and, long and hard of, long and hard at. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of work for our sustainability. And, you know, part of the recommendation now is only using disposable wares. So that's, that really flies in the face of what we were trying to do as a, as a district. Um, reception areas in our, in our schools, setting those up. Um, we've ordered plexiglass um, in those areas so our secretaries feel safe and comfortable in their workspaces as people enter um, and having spaces as people enter the buildings um, and meet with folks. Individual offices, we try to have uh, meetings 
um, with folks. What does that look like? So again, these are just based off the of CDC recommendations, the, these graphics. School bus capacity is another huge one. Um, and then um, when you look at where we have now and the potential of um, social distancing seating, eight students, as I mentioned, we're looking at you know, 60 additional bus runs if we were to run that setup. Um, and then what does it look like? Could we have parents um, who have siblings are they willing to put both siblings on the bus together or sitting next to each other? Um, again, a lot of iterations to, to have conversations about, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware that we are having these conversations um, and this is what the fallout um, looks like at this point. But disaffecting the buses in between routes and who does that and how is it done? Um, and preparing for increased drop off You know, if we ask parents to transport their own child, I don't know how many of you have been at the middle school or high school on a rainy day or even at the Stony Brook school on a rainy day when everybody drives their child. Um, the, the roads are backed up. So that's something we, we are, the township police are on um, one of our, excuse me, on one of our committees to talk about that. What does that look like? Um, and just kind of wrapping up, I, I know I went through a lot in a short amount of time, but I just wanted to give everybody up to speed, this presentation will be up on the website so you can look through it. Um, but one thing we know is for many of our students, school is the safest place for them to be. Um, we know that there is pressure to reopen um, from a lot of different levels. Um, we know that nothing can replace in-person education. Um, so we need to move towards in-person education. Um, and for a lot of kids, remote learning was, was an easy transition. For many kids, it was a difficult transition um, for a variety of reasons. Um, the importance of us moving back to in-person education and finding a way there is important to all of us, but we need to make sure that we can do it in a safe manner and that we can do it with the guidance that we have been provided. Um, you know, continuing with remote learning, it does have a lowered risk of transmission um, for vulnerable levels. Um, returning to school, you know, nice thing is we can get away from the screens um, which I think we've all been glued to. Um, engaging the student's prefrontal cortex, we need to get back there. Um, we know that an in-person education is a better quality education. We know mental health needs. We've seen an uptick in those and getting students back um, to that. Um, we know that when we can monitor and help students with their, their, their eating, um, many students eat, eat better or more healthy. Um, students are physically active. You know, the we reason why PE is mandated in the state of New Jersey is because um, when given the option, many students don't exercise. Um, big one for me in our, in our push for social emotional health, students will have access to nursing, counseling, and social services. Um, and the big part about returning to school is our parents, our school personnel, our first responders can get back to work. Um, folks aren't getting paid, uh, many of those, and um, they can get out to, to saving lives. Um, but we know that when we do come back, you know, as much as we can do put into place, that students will have difficulty socially distancing, hand washing, um, the constant hygiene, and the masking. Um, you know, that's, that's going to be a challenge for all of us, um, making sure that everybody is adhering to this. Uh, we've already seen a breakdown sometimes in, in social occasions. Um, how can we meet all the, the COVID controls and safety standards of the school district? Um, and what happens if we do have an outbreak? How do we deal with that? Um, so that's um, kind of big things that we're working on. Um, overarching, do want to highlight a couple of areas um, for you. Special education, obviously these students are our most vulnerable population. We need to get them back to in-person education. Um, at this time, given the timing of the guidance and the vague, vagueness of the guidance that we've been provided, extended school year will remain remote. Um, and that is every school district in the county as well as all the special services school districts have made that decision. We just don't have the mechanism or the guidance to, to put it into place by July 6th. Um, however, we will uh, plan to begin in-person testing for our students and implementing therapies um, this summer. Uh, in person for our, our special needs students. Um, but there needs to be some level of support change um, if we continue with remote learning. 
All right, I'm almost done, but this one is a big one too. Athletics, this is what we know now. Um, the governing body of New Jersey sports, the NJSIAA, said that there's aiming for schools to begin summer workouts on July 13th. Um, we expect some sort of guidelines um, from the NJSIA June 19th. Um, the final decisions about workouts, they say will be up to each school district um, if, they, if they're going to adhere to this July, uh, mid-July start date um, and that full, uh, like a schedule will begin on around Labor Day weekend. It's important to note there's been a lot of confusion regarding the rec sports. Um, so I just put this in. This was a quote directly from the NJSIA. Um, that school sports must be in sync with our schools. So if the governor comes in and says we're going to be remote um, in September, that doesn't mean that school sports can, can continue down that path. It doesn't happen that way. So if we're remote in September, school sports will be remote in September. All right. Um, things that we know as of now, they're looking at separating sports into three risk tiers. The higher risk tiers are football, wrestling, boys lacrosse, competitive cheer and dance, moderate risk. Basketball, soccer, ice hockey, field hockey, girls across swimming relays, swimming relays, water polo, crew with two or more rowers in the shell. Um, you need to be aware, too, of some of the uh, information that's been shared so far. Uh, the ability to move from moderate risk to low risk is um, if the equipment can be appropriately clean, cleaned um, and participants use masks in between. Um, so you would have to wipe down in between use of each competitor. Um, low risk is our running and throwing events in track and field cross country, um, but they're looking at staggered starts for cross country. So students would be last I read somewhere about 30 feet apart. Golf, individual swimming, weightlifting, uh, those cheers. So that's kind of, this is again, this is what we know as of June 15th, um, based on information we've received. And they're looking at a three phase plan for sports. Um, and each phase requires uh, thorough cleaning of equipment, lots of hand sanitizer around, no sharing of water bottles, uh, showering at home, social distancing, um, that the CDC guidelines, uh, adherence of the CDC guidelines. Um, we, they're looking at right now, as we know, that we would require screenings before each practice uh, with temperature checks. Um, players and coaches who are vulnerable would not be participating in the first two phases of the plan. Um, all sports would uh, would um, face these same restrictions. Um, phase one, teams would not be able to touch the same piece of equipment without first sanitizing it, which would be present, uh, you know, you couldn't pass a ball in football, baseball, basketball, soccer, or volleyball. Um, so you can see kind of some of the challenges with this. Uh, if you have soccer practice and we're in phase one, and you can't touch a soccer ball that your somebody else touched um, presents a challenge. Um, so practices restrictions in uh, phase one. What we know as of today is uh, no more than ten people. No use of the locker room. No weight room exercises that require a spotter. You could use it by yourself. Uh, phase one and two athletes would be broken up with pods of five to ten within practices. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do, you know, the old Gatorade jugs. You bring your own water bottle, um, and that's what you're expected to use. Um, and, you know, so you would have these pods of five to ten participants, and you wouldn't mix up things throughout practices, again, based on what the guidance that we've received now. Um, so you would have the same pod of ten kids, and um, they would continue to practice together for the foreseeable future. Um, and the the National Federation of High School Sports also recommends that athletes wear masks during phases one and two when not performing strenuous aerobic exercise. So, you know, if you're just standing around after you've gotten through a run, you come back and you put a mask on. Again, this is all information that we're receiving now, but I know athletics have received a number of uh, questions once the, the recreation uh, guidelines came out, people were asking specifically about what will athletics look like. This is what I know as of today, um, and this is what about 100 people in our district are working on to, to move us forward. Um, so I'm going to stop that presentation um, and open it up to anybody who has any questions. As I said, 
that this is available for anybody on our website. Um, I knew I threw a lot of information at you. Um, we are going to release a survey to the community to, uh, to get some feedback about their comfort level of students returning to school. Um, but this is all the information that we know as of June 15th today. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. And I promise I will stop talking. Tom, one thing we've done in the past for athletics is have in-school physicals available. Is there any plan for anything like that? Or, you know, sometimes even getting a physical can be a little bit difficult now. So there is a pending bill that will allow students to use last year's physical for this year. Um, there's some folks that are vehemently against that. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. But that's one of the ways to work around that. Adam, um, but um, you know we would have to. You know we're obviously not against um, providing them. If our if our physician will provide them and we can do it in a socially distanced, responsible manner, we would absolutely do that. Thank you, Don. Yeah, uh, just um, you had mentioned adding sixty bus runs. How many bus runs are there now? So, Mr. Calavita, do you have that? I know we just went over that for our school start time committee. I want to say 55. Wow. Okay. That's, That's off the top of my head. So it basically doubled the number of bus runs that, that yeah. we would need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Smith? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that very comprehensive overview. Uh, with that, I believe we've ended the superintendent's report, correct? <laughs> but thank you. Sorry, um, yes. Uh, no, no, thank you. We, we appreciate it. So we will move on to item D, consent agenda. Uh, I would like to request uh, a motion uh, that the items that have been marked with an asterisk be um, accepted as the consent agenda, please. So moved. Second. Oh, Debbie, I had yes. one Any that I wanted further discussion? To... Yes. <laughs> I, I had one that I wanted to remove from consent, please. If that could be I-7, please. Okay. We will reserve that until the end. Uh, as for the rest of the uh, items on the consent agenda, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? The motion carries. So with regard to um, number I-7, uh, Mr. Sawicki. Okay, sure. Great, thank Aye. you. So I-7 uh, concern... Public comment first, Deb. Oh. Jeez, I'm sorry? Public comment. I'm sorry. sorry, Bob. Public comment would come before. G is before I. So we'll oh, go. I'm so sorry. Okay. I, I apologize. We'll get back to that, Mr. Sawicki. So we are going to open up for public comment. Members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting. You are asked to state your name, address, and municipality. In response to your comments, the Board of Education may respond or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting so that the matter is researched by district administration. Public comment is now open. Do we have any members of the public who have comment to share? Okay, seeing none, public comment is closed. And now we will go back to item I-7, please. Okay, great. Thank you, Debbie. So item I-7 concerns um, moving some of the district um, excess revenue uh, into capital reserve. Uh, it basically authorizes this movement of, a, of an, an amount up to 2.5 million. And in a normal year, um, you know, we do this before the end of the, the school it's fiscal year, which ends June 30th. To, we have to make that resolution if we choose to, to move some money into capital reserve by that time. And in a normal year, once we pass the resolution, we would go ahead and, and move that money into capital reserve by that time. 
uh, this year being a different year in terms of the timing of our audit, as well as the timing of the, the uh, firming up of the state budget, it's a little bit different. So um, in finance and facilities, we had discussed a, a plan for how we were going to deal with that. And I just, uh, I would ask Bob to elaborate on what our plans are, uh, just so everyone on the board is aware of what was discussed in finance and facilities. Um, so nothing, basically nothing is really changing. We're, we're doing what we always do. We don't merely make the adjustment into capital reserve until the audit is finalized in the fall, sometime in September, October. But what we discussed in finance facilities is to um, revisit this as a, as a group prior to making the, uh, the transfer. Typically when the auditor said you have this much to transfer, we would transfer what we um, had planned on it in June and we didn't revisit it. This year the, the committee wanted to revisit it. Um, just as Adam said, to wait until things firm up with the state budget um, to see where um, the number falls with the audit and then um, have a, a in-depth discussion with the committee and perhaps the board uh, as we enter September, October. So um, the, the agenda item you're, you're asked to approve tonight has to be done in June. Um, or it does not happen. It has to happen. It only can happen between June first and uh, June first and Ju uh, June thirtieth. Um, so we're reserving our right to do that um, prior at, at the conclusion of our audit. So um, it's a it's a sound um, decision that we'll you know we'll just wait until we get final numbers and um, see how all this plays out through the summer and into the early fall. Hey, Bob, what is that the bill that's pending regarding uh, capital reserves? Um, good question, Tom. There's a there's a bill that's pending right now. I'm not sure where it sits um, and wh whether it's been voted upon or not yet. But it, the capital reserve is highly restrictive. It can only be used for approved capital projects or to offset debt payments. But this bill will allow it to be used for um, emergency purchases related to the pandemic. No. Um, that's still being discussed. Um, as to what um, it can be used for, it's probably what's, it's being hung up on. Um, we did, you know, uh, districts are getting CARES funds. We have, we're approving uh, the acceptance of our CARES COVID-related funds funding today. It's very little. Um, if we were to run into issues um, going forward, this bill, if passed, would give us additional flexibility to use um, our capital reserve. But again, I would hesitate using that only in the most dire of circumstances. Um, and let's hope it doesn't get to that. But again, we're the, the board is leaving itself the um, most flexibility at this point to make uh, informed decisions as the summer and early fall um, come through. Adam, I hope that's that's exactly what I, I, I was hoping you would share with us. Thanks, Bob. Now all we need is a motion and a second to move ahead. But was there any further question on that from any of the board members? I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to request a motion for the board to approve the resolution uh, regarding the capital reserve deposit, please. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstaining? The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will ask Mr. Sawicki to give the Finance Committee report, please. Great. So, yes, we met uh, last Monday. So, in addition to that, uh, we went through the exhaustive list of uh, annual approvals that we all just approved on consent. So, thank you. Um, let's see. I'll give you some. Let's see. In terms of some highlights, there is one good, two, a couple good bits of news. Um, in, in terms of uh, transportation during the COVID time period, uh, we did negotiate a, uh, uh, a rate payment for the missed days of our busing, and it came in favorable for us. So, so thanks, Mr. Colavita and the Transportation Department for that. The other good news is uh, in terms of our self-insurance, uh, it appears that we did quite well last year. And, and Bob, I wrote down, I believe we we are able to fund our IBNR after the first year. We should be. We haven't gotten the final numbers from our actuary, but we should 
we should be in a position to fund the full IBNR. Okay, so th that's very good news. Um, we got an update in terms of uh, the current 2020 state budget, as as was shared. Uh, we were informed our state uh, aid had been reduced by $291,000, and we continue to monitor uh, that situation. As note, there were some favorable things in terms of our insurance, and um, that can help in that regard. But we are facing a potential loss of some extra revenue from when we rent at our facilities. So that's something that will impact us as well. And then finally, we uh, we get, got some updates in terms of the facilities projects. So uh, you know, works continuing on the front entrance, moving uh, and reconfiguring where the the um, the old front entrance was, moving the memorial. Um, progress was made with regard to um, some con contractors for that, and um, uh, the media centers were were finished. So this is, this is very good news. The so. front entrance, if you have it, I, I'm sure there hasn't been many people who've been over there, but the front, it, it's moving along. The steps have been moved already, and they're starting to build the block wall. So that's going to be done, you know, in the next several weeks. And it's going to be a, they'll finish off that area of the building. Looks good so far, though. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Deb, if I could just jump in here. A hot of off course. the presses. Um, <clears throat> uh, Bob's office received the Association of School Business Officials Excellence in Financial Reporting for uh, year, is this year eight, Bob? Eight, eight years. Eight, eight in a row. So. Thank you for sharing. That's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks. Congrats, Bob. Thank you. We, appre we appreciate all that you do. Speech, speech. Uh. <laughs> It's so funny with okay. this that I can't see who's talking. <laughs> you can't see all the people anymore. I know, right? All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Sawicki, for that report. That's good. Uh, moving on, uh, personnel committee. Uh, Ms. Murray, would you like to give your report, please? I don't mute myself there. Um, so I'd like um, a motion, please, to move my exorbitant amounts of uh, personnel actions. <laughs> so moved. Second. Thank you. Um, should I make my report first and then we do the roll call, Mr. Calavita? We can do the, yes, you can do your report and then we'll do the roll call. Okay. Well, we met this evening and we reviewed the agenda and many new hires that will be taking the place of our retirees who we honored this evening. Um, congratulations to all of our retirees. Um, and with that being said, we are also excited to announce the appointment of Ms. Patricia Pinelli as the new principal of Central High School. Ms. Pinelli has been serving as vice principal at the high school over the last four years and has been in the district since 2008. We'll be posting her vice principal position tomorrow morning and conducting a search in the coming weeks. And <laughs> intense sadness. I don't even want to talk about this, but I would like to acknowledge the resignation of Christine Abrams and I'd like to vote no on that. Um, she is our K through 12 supervisor of counseling. Christine will be relocating to Florida to continue her career in school counseling. So that means um, I have somewhere to visit. She has done just an incredible job leading our counseling department over the last 11 years. Um, she transformed the guidance office into the counseling office. We are in the process of conducting a search for her replacement and expect to interview candidates with a committee in the next two weeks. And those are gonna be incredibly difficult shoes to fill for sure. We reviewed a draft of the per diem rates for the 2020-2021 school year. They will be on the agenda on July 13th for board approval. I'm also happy to report that we have reached an agreement with the HBNAA, the Hopewell Valley Network Administrators Association, or better known as our techs. This was our last bargaining agreement due to expire at the end of the school year. So all associations now have settled bargaining agreements. 
And with that, um, I'd like to um, also acknowledge Tony um, Suzo leaving us. And this is the perfect time to talk about that because in my five and a half years on the board, I have also been involved and um, chaired the negotiations committee. So I've gone through two full cycles with um, Tony Suzo, and I really don't even know how we're going to move forward without him. Um, I want to thank him for um, ensuring that we have settled all the bargaining agreements before his departure, um, and to say that his creativity, um, his ability to um, negotiate in times when sometimes it didn't seem there were there was a way for us to move forward um really put the district in a very great place both um with regard to utilization of our resources but also um for morale and um you are going to be so incredibly missed and to say to that you and christine are leaving us i just i i'm just so sad um so thank you both for everything that you've done for um our district um, thank you, i appreciate that <laughs> So sad. Right. Um, so with that, um, to, uh, sorry, Bob. How do we do all the different personal actions? Do we do them all as one roll call, or do we have to? Yeah, isolate? We're going to do them all as one roll call. Okay, great. Well, may you please make a roll call. Do that. <laughs> Ms. Grillo. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Herbert. Yes. Ms. Long. Yes. Mr. Mason. Yes. Ms. Did Murray. you say me? No, Ms. Murray. Oh, yes. Now Ms. O'Reilly. Yes. Mr. Sawicki. Yes. yes. Ms. Tracy. Yes. And Ms. Linthorst. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Murray, for that report. We will move on to Education Program Committee. Ms. O'Reilly, would you like to give your report, please? Yes, they would. So the Education Committee met and we discussed the Summer Bridge Program, which is starting this summer. Uh, we received an overview of the program. And um, this program is for incoming ninth graders. And the purpose is to build academic and social emotional skills that are going to help them um, make the social transition to high school, uh, help them navigate the high school course load, uh, make new friends and also build supportive relationships. And it's primarily for, so honors and AP, English, math and history. Um, so other than teachers recommending students, the criteria um, also came about where the district analyzed data which revealed achievement gaps among subgroups of ELL students, Black, Hispanic, um, male, female in certain subject areas. And this program is designed to recruit students for, this, for the Summer Bridge to ease their transition to high school um, and also improve the academic achievement in the subgroups. So the cost of the program, uh, the budget is $7,500 around there. I think that is an overestimate because due to not having transportation and it's also dependent on the number of students that will be coming because uh, it's going to be virtual, correct? Virtual. Yes, that's correct. But I wanted to make sure that we included that. I didn't right. know it was a moving target if we can bring students in, but I, the chances are very unlikely that's going to work uh, out. So we plan for bringing them in, but um, you know, you never know if we're able to change that. So the other thing was we did discuss a review of the exceptionally able program uh, for both elementary and secondary levels. But I think the committee determined that we really need further discussion on that, um, on where it's going, the purpose and goals. So that's really it. Did I leave anything out, Rosetta? No, I think we covered everything and we kind of covered, you know, some some of the work around reopening the schools, which Dr. Smith. Yeah, already covered. Right. right. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. O'Reilly. Uh, moving on to community relations, Ms. Long. Yes, hello. Um, as is typical with our committee, our, what we discussed in our meeting this week is what Dr. Smith presented in his uh, 
superintendent's report. We had discussed um, the phases of reopening and what it could possibly look like. We discussed equity in our district and um, the conversation that was taking place this past Saturday. We looked at um, the communication out to families, you know, to show what the district has already done and um, that we need more community action, not just the school district. Um, we discussed the survey that would be going out and um, a little bit we, uh, about the end of the year activities. I know, um, I think eighth grade had a clap out something today. A couple of the elementaries, I know Tollgate is tomorrow and then the virtual graduation Thursday night and then July 18th, something happening for the seniors as well. So that's it. Thank you, we appreciate that. So moving on to policy, I would like uh, to move the items up for first reading. Um, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Oh, Aye. Sorry. <laughs> Opposed, abstaining. The motion carries. Uh, the items for first reading uh, this time around are policy and regulation 5330 uh, regarding administration of medical marijuana. Uh, the uh, statutes have recently required uh, school districts to develop a policy authorizing parents, guardians, and primary caregivers to assist a student in the medical use of marijuana uh, on school grounds, on a school bus, or attending a school-sponsored event. Um, it indicates that the policy must establish protocols for this um, with regard to registration uh, for the process for the primary caregiver and the student um, and to identify locations on school grounds where the medical marijuana may be administered. Um, and this also prohibits the administration of medical marijuana to a student by smoking or through another form of inhalation. Uh, no changes were made to either the policy or the regulation in the first read. And we have uh, any questions on that? Okay, then we have uh, policies up for, oh, I'm sorry, we have another uh, two policies for the first reading were the policy 5538 and uh, regulation 5538 for random drug testing. Um, we uh, had committed uh, as a board uh, two years ago to do an annual review for this uh, policy uh, to determine the proper Im implementation of it. Um, the, regula the regulation contains one small but important revision. It provides anyone who misses the deadline um, for the opportunity to appeal to the superintendent. Um, and, and, you know, we just wanted to make sure that, that if students miss the deadline for some um, reason that they, they don't miss out on the chance to participate in activities if, if they should still have the chance to do so. Um, any questions on that? Okay, moving along to the items for second reading. Uh, again, no changes were requested during the first reading. Uh, we have policy and regulation 1581 for domestic violence and policy and regulation 5330 for administering an opioid antidote. Um, and for the items on second read, uh, I would request a roll call vote, please. Or roll call motion. <laughs> motion for a roll call vote, please. So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Roll, call, roll call vote, please. I apologize. Oh, cool. Okay, Ms. Long. Yes. Mr. Mason. Yes. Ms. Murray. Yes. yes. Ms. Murray. <laughs> yes. Ms. O'Reilly. Yes. Mr. Swicky. Yes. Ms. Tracy. Yes. Ms. Grillo. Yes. Mr. Herbert. Yes. And Ms. Linthorst. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We'll open our uh, second public comment period. Members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting. 
You are asked to state your name, address, and municipality. In response to your comments, the Board of Education may respond or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting so that the matter is researched by district administration. Public comment is now open. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Trish Pinelli, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for giving me this opportunity as the new principal of the high school. I have been incredibly fortunate over the past several years to not only have the support of an outstanding administration, but also have the support of the Board of Education. So thank you all very much, and I'm really looking forward to this opportunity. Ms. Pinelli, again, congratulations to you, and, and we look forward to all of the exciting things that will be happening at the high school uh, under your uh, charge. Uh, so thank you for stepping up and, and for taking on such an important position in our district. Any other uh, public comment? Okay. Seeing none, public comment is now closed. We will move on to the review of board calendars for June and July. Uh, shall we go with education program first, please? Any thoughts on dates, Ms. O'Reilly? I think she's muted. Unmute, Deb. <laughs> Sorry, okay, how about uh, Monday the 13th? Same time, what was that, two o'clock? Yeah, I wanted to just, uh, shift off of Tuesdays if we could. My summer schedule is going to be a little bit different. That's fine with me. Uh, Dr. Therese, how does that look for you? And we are talking about July, correct? Yeah. July 13th, it's a Monday, and we said two o'clock. Yes, I'm good. I'm good. So we don't want to put another one in June. You're fine. Just wait, wait until July is what I meant to say. Um. No. Okay. Sounds good then. We're but for our policy committee meeting, how does that look for folks? If we're looking at, where are we at this point on the calendar? Um, do we do we still need another, do we need a June? No. Mm -hmm. No. So oh, would that be- the ninth work? I, that that is a with would, would that be an agenda review meeting on the ninth? No, the meeting's on the twentieth. Oh, it's on the twentieth. Thank you, not the thirteenth. Okay. Um, yeah, that the ninth would work for me. Doctor Smith. Yeah. <laughs> works for me. Works for me. All right. Eight a.m. Yep. There we go. Okay. Finance and facility. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was say, Adam, I was thinking that the Monday before again. Yeah, the 13th would be perfect, Bob. Time for everybody? What, what, what time? Uh, the week. Did you want to try the 530 again? Yeah, 530 is good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Community relations. We can do the Thursday before, which is the 16th. Three o'clock is what we've been yeah. doing. That works. Okay. Good. Personnel. <laughs> I guess we'll have that on the the twentieth before the meeting again. Yeah, seven o'clock is probably seven o'clock. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, and I uh, would request a motion to approve the calendars for June and July, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? The motion carries. And I think we move into new business now. So uh, under new business, I uh, just wanted to briefly discuss our board self-evaluation. I did relay information to this to board members uh, in mid-May, but I will include notes in this week's uh, green notes as well on this. Um, we would like to have the evaluations completed no later than Friday, June 26th, uh, so that we can review them at our next board meeting on July 13th. Um, unlike the CSA evaluation, 
Uh, there's no statutory requirement um, for boards to complete the self-evaluation, but it is considered a best practice and um, is used to assist boards in their continuous improvement uh, and is recommended by the New Jersey School Board Association. Um, and it really, it, it does it, there's no specific time frame for getting it done during the year, but this is typically the time of year that, that our board uh, works on this. So um, again, I'll have notes in the green notes um and let me know once you see those if you have any questions but it's uh, you know a self-led process along the same lines as the csa evaluation was okay and with that i will request a motion to move into executive session please so moved second all in favor aye aye aye, aye. Oh, and I'm sorry that the motion is um, to spend time in executive session to review the superintendent's evaluation and um, a staff matter. And also the HVAA, HVAA negotiations, HVAA oh. negotiations. Thank you. And I don't believe any action will be taken. No action will be taken. All in favor, one more time. Aye. 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 Opposed, abstaining. The motion carries. Uh, we will we will switch over to our other channel. But if anyone would like a two minute <laughs> quick break, it's been a long time. <laughs> Dr. Smith, did you have something to add? No, just talking about process. So we'll leave oh. this meeting open. Yes. And then we'll go back to the. Uh, we'll come back after executive session. Yes. Do we have a new one for executive session or is it the same as last time? Same one. It should be listed as, as 745 executive session. It should be in your in the board calendar, not your calendar, the board calendar. Okay. See everybody over there. Oh, yes. The motion did carry. Here we go. <laughs> Good God. <laughs>
my mic is off due to the size of the call. <laughs> we were on a much larger call a few moments ago. What is that about? Uh, it, no, it's been acting crazy. Google uh, Meet has been real strange lately. I don't know what's going on. They made a lot of changes, but now there's so many glitches. Not that there weren't already glitches, but it worked. Yeah. Google, Google's gone googly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, think we, I think we broke it. Yeah, we may have. We're getting to the end of that free subscription time. <laughs> That's what happens, right? Yeah. That's right. We've worn out our welcome. When is that supposed to end, that freebie? June 30th. No way. Yeah. Way. Yeah. That's why we're exploring um, WebEx. But web did you did you WebEx doesn't let you see all the people either, does it, Tom? No, uh, see that's what you can play around with grid views. WebEx does have rooms, which are nice. And if we go remote learning, that's one of the things we heard from loud and clear for the teachers is they'd like to be able to do group work and have the kids go into different rooms. Mm -hmm. I guess a nice part about Zoom is you could set that up. We missing one person? Deborah Raleigh again? Is that who we're missing? Yeah. Jeff's here. Yeah. John's here. Bill. Bill. Not me this time. <laughs> I, see, I don't see you. There you are. Four, five, six, one. seven, eight. No, I think we're all here. Where's Jess? Eight, nine. You're all here. You're all here. I can't see everyone. I, I, I know this link. It's on the website. There she is. <laughs> all right. All right, no more Google dancing for tonight. We are done. Uh, I would like right. to request a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstaining. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a you. Good night. Night. Good we'll see you soon. And congratulations to the parents of the graduates again. Absolutely. Yeah. Adam. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. See you soon. Good night. Good night. Good night.